in the Farmington, Connecticut. And thanks to the kindness of Connecticut Congressman John Lawson, who I've known for many years, I had the opportunity to attend the Democratic National Convention in Denver, Colorado that year. Attending that convention where Obama gave his great speech as a Democratic candidate for president, and the election of President Obama were what I would call the climax of my involvement in the civil rights struggle. I never thought that during my lifetime we could and would elect the president of African heritage. It is a proud moment in the history of our country, the world, and for me. Even though I consider his election the apex of my personal civil rights involvement, as long as I have breath, I'll continue my civil rights and community service as well as political, political advising. For me, President Obama's election highlighted the fruit of the years of struggle of my ancestors from the slave ship to freedom. It was a crowning point of my involvement in the civil rights movement to my election as the first popular elected mayor of African American heritage within the New England states of these United States. It was also a great victory for the untold thousands who sacrificed their lives. That it, they, they, they enabled me to say, why not, which was my election uh, call during my election. It enabled them to say, why not, for President Obama to say, yes, we can, and for America to say, yes, we did. That's basically how I ended my book. This picture of me is 20 or 30 years old, so I'm, I'm much greater now. I have the pictures on the back. Um, <laughs> that's how I used to look at City Hall. If you have any questions for me, I'll be more than glad to try to answer them. As you now yes, we get all the different benefits from this new taxation, taking money from the communities themselves. That has now happened. They do have a downtown tax in the city of Hartford. And if you notice now, the communities in Hartford are still suffering uh, from the, number two things. Number one, the lack of employment opportunities, because uh, I would say 90% of those who work in our city in the better jobs come from the suburbs, not from the city of Hartford. He was speaking a very, a very, very good point that uh, the, it's what, it's what I call the haves and have not mentality that, that we find in our communities. Um, and of course, having come from a family of welfare, I faced a lot of that because um, until I became mayor, I wasn't a mayor, I became very popular prior to that. And that's what we have now. We have a lot of divisions in our community. Uh, we don't come together uh, as groups. Uh, one of the things I argue about now is even in our churches, our churches don't come together to unify. When I was mayor, I had challenged all the churches in Harvard. I said, well, just think of one collection. Every Sunday you put it together, you'd be surprised at the amount of work you can do in the city of Harvard as you make changes. Of course, that never happened. Because every church wants to have their own little center, they want to have their own little elderly housing, they want to have their own little group. Um, they have ministerial alliances, but most of ministerial alliances may have four or five churches that belong to them. And the major churches that can actually do uh, good for the city, they don't join the alliances that work with them themselves. And that's also a problem with our organizations. Our organizations don't come together to work together. And we find that even today with, with most of our organizations in the city of Parker, you got the, you may have the NACP working here, the Urban League working over there, CRT working somewhere else all of their own projects. And you'd be surprised that, and, and that's one thing I found in the civil rights movement, when people actually came together and actually fought, that's when you found changes. But what happens, as long as we're divided and state by the changes are not going to happen. And I, I preach that all the time, but unfortunately, it's a lot of deaf ears, because everyone now more just looking out for themselves. And I find It's, it's amazing because he was a very quiet, unassuming person. He was not, you know, we, with his speeches, you would think he was a great dynamic person who made a lot of noise and was, well, you know, was very outgoing, but he was very quiet and, and very humble. Uh, when I first met him, it was in District 65 in New York City where he came to recruit. And he met with a group of, group of us. I was a junior pharmacist at the time, and he was recruiting both finances and people to go south in the civil rights movement. So he, they called a luncheon at the union and they invited us to that luncheon. And when he first walked in the room, 
If you didn't know who he was, you wouldn't know him. But he was very quiet, very unassuming. He was sitting down, reading, uh, talking very quietly. Uh, <clears throat> then when he got to speak, he was altogether a very different person. Now, in his speeches, he's a great orator. But to hear him speak and to just sit down and talk with him, he was two different people. I've had a chance, the opportunity to sit down with him doing some right movement at breakfast and lunch and actually chat and talk with him. And, you know, he talked about his church and his religion. That was his main function. Actually, he was a minister. And one of his greatest concerns was that he was getting away from the ministry, getting involved in the civil rights movement. Uh, and uh, actually, he, when he was recruited, as you know, he had no intentions of getting involved in the civil rights movement. He was a young minister that just went to uh, <clears throat> Alabama to actually, uh, and someone asked to mention, well, there's a young preacher that sounds good, and we need him to actually lead us. Uh, he first said no, and then he actually talked him into it, uh, and, and that's how he actually got involved. Uh, but he was a very humble, a very mild person. Uh, I had an opportunity to the heart. He came to Harvard several times. In fact, in his younger days, he worked in the tobacco fields in Connecticut. Uh, at that time, a lot of young black people. Number one, uh, I wasn't living a bad life, but I knew I had to live a better life the rest of my life because whether I, I liked it or not, the kids knew who I knew me and I would know them. And uh, so I was very, I thought about it. I talked to my family. Uh, three members of the Board of Education came to me and asked me. They said, because of my involvement, uh, and commitment to education and the students. Uh, could they name a school after me? And I said, first I said no. I said, I don't think so, because the school had never named me after a living person. They said, well, we want to because we think it's good for the kids. The school is in one of the most disadvantaged areas of our city, where 85% of the parents are from single parent heads of household, and most of the parents are from welfare, just like my family. So I felt, felt that if I could be a model in any way constructively, then I said, ah, finally, I said, okay, I would allow them to do that. So I tried to get to school at least twice a month to talk to the kids, to meet the kids, and then I had to do some counseling. That's what I'll be doing mainly. Uh, in fact, at one time, I served as a local preacher at my church, but I gave that up mainly because I did not have the time to devote to doing that. I'm still a civil minister, but I don't do ministry because I'd rather work, uh, do community work, which is ministry to me anyway. But I try to get into schools, I try to get into prisons, I try to get into the high schools and also into the colleges. The drug trade is very popular, not long lasting. The prisons are actually full of, of people that have given up, and, and it's really tough. But I think we begin to see actually a change in attitudes in the direction of education to begin with. Uh, for instance, at my school, we're now getting parents involved in the educational process, which is key and which is important because a lot of the parents are also tend to educate. So they don't understand and don't, they don't teach their kids the need to actually finish school because they haven't finished themselves. The middle school was renamed in 1989, and some of the parents that come to school now were kids in the school when the school was renamed, and then now they're parents, and uh, a lot of them are dropouts. So it's important, I think, that we get more mentors into our school systems. I, I, the schools are not bad. I think the problem is that the, the system needs to change as far as education is concerned. One of the major problems we find in Harkin is that the emphasis has been taken off of public schools and put them in magnet schools and charter schools and a lot of the support system, a lot of the funding, a lot of the best teachers now are going to charter schools and magnet schools leaving the public schools with some of the teachers that were less tenured who really have nowhere else to go. That's unfortunate. In Harvard, what they did now for the first time in history, uh, the superintendent went to the legislature and wanted to change it where teachers could not just be fired across the board like they normally are and then teachers with tenure would move to another school, which means that you have a public school where you have good teachers but if someone in another public school uh, actually was, were to be fired,